just have a business name that you've been doing business for a while, you could still own a trademark without registration, but obviously you don't get any of those, uh, any of these protections. Um, it's harder to prove infringement in court because as, as opposed to a registration, now you have to show that, you know, you actually have a, uh, uh, you need to show when you've started using the mark and how long you've had it and, and you know, where, what geographies you use it under, you know, that sort of thing. So it's a bigger pain in the butt. Uh, there are certain things that can't be registered, like trade dress, and we'll go ahead and talk about that in a little bit. Uh, here's an example. I figured we're at, a, we're at a paleo conference, so let's just make fun of McDonald's. Um, so the, the word mark here is McDonald's. Um, the logo is the, uh, is the um, golden arch uh, right here. And then they have their slogan, which is... Uh, I'm loving it. Um, trade dress is kind of, you, you, could, you could see this trade dress kind of all over their buildings. And the way that it is, it's, it's basically these yellow, it's the golden arch, and then this red background. So you can see that the roof is red, and then they have these like yellow highlights on their roofs. This is kind of an older style McDonald's. You could just see, and then the, this uh, uh, french fries uh, container, you know, it's got the yellow bars and then the, the, the red. So that's just kind of what we call trade dress, okay? And this is so distinctive. I mean, this is a McDonald's in China in like a tourist spot. Look at this scene. <laughs> it looks nothing like um, something that you would, you would normally associate. But you, you see that M, and you see the colors, and you ne immediately know that this is, a, this is a, a McDonald's and that you can probably go buy a Big Mac or something in China if you feel so inclined. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about distinctive, distinctiveness and the strength of trademarks because this is going to be important as you go ahead and choose your name. Uh, how the, the different strengths of the marks have different legal connotations. Um, generally, we start with the most powerful type of mark, which is a fanciful mark, okay? So an example of this is Xerox. It's a word in the dictionary that the Xerox Corporation uh, made up. It's not in the dictionary, <laughs> so, so, so yeah. So it's just, it's just a, a word that has no other meaning other than to give uh, to, to refer to the Xerox company and its brand of photocopiers or what have you. So um, that's kind of a, called a fanciful mark, okay? So the next step down is what we call an arbitrary mark, is where that, that, that mark has a dictionary definition, but it has nothing to do with what your product is. For example, Apple computers, okay? Apple is uh, not a computer in the dictionary. Um, the next step down is suggestive. So a lot of marks are kind of in this category where you basically have um, a word that sort of evokes a connotation that associates with your product. A good example here is Greyhound. It's a, a, a sleek, fast land animal um, that, and, and now it's being used to uh, trademark a bus service, essentially. So these marks are what we call entitled to registration. That means that if you could prove that your mark is in one of these three categories, the USPTO has to give you a registration. Okay, so if you file an application, if you have a mark that's like this, you're gonna have to grant it. Uh, this next two categories are generally not entitled to registration. They're like weak marks, okay? So um, descriptive, and I'm just gonna pick on Ted's Montana Grill for a moment because we went there for dinner and the service wasn't very good. Um, so a descriptive mark is where the, the, the words that comprise the mark uh, just describes what you're selling, okay? So for example, Ted's Montana Grill would be des descriptive for a restaurant in Bozeman owned by Ted, okay? Um, or it's, there's a subcategory here called deceptively misdescriptive. Uh, it's the same restaurant, but it's in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, so that's deceptively misdescriptive. You're, you're nothing to do with, you know, Montana and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, this is actually a kind of a, a big issue. So, uh, for example, you know, if you have Arrowhead Spring Water, you know, bottled in, uh, uh, you know, Pittsburgh or something like that in, in, in registration, um, that could uh, uh, give you some issues. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the weakest form of mark is the generic, where the word, the mar word mark is literally what you're selling. Uh, and these are uh, sometimes not that obvious, but you know you have agua bottled water, which is just water in Spanish. Um, you have a, a, a way that fanciful marks like Xerox could sometimes fall into the generic category. They, they really could fall from grace because you know Xerox got so ubiquitous in the, the 70s and 80s as photocopiers that people just started to say, hey, why don't you take it just down to the Xerox machine and then make me a couple of you know, Xeroxes, and then they started using that as a, as a, as a common noun and, and a verb. Uh, that's when you would 
kind of fall into that genetic category, uh, gener generic category, and then they had to spend a lot of money to try to correct this misuse in among the, the, the common public. So I, I hope you're as successful as that and that that's a really good problem to have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so if you're not entitled to registration, if you file and then you're kind of rejected based on that, um, you can register on what's called the supplemental register. This, this is not registration. It, it goes on a list. It's kind of like a waiting list for five years. And uh, it gives you a presumption of what we call acquired distinctiveness, which means that that particular word mark that you're using have acquired secondary meaning in five years that people recognize that word as also representing your goods or services. So then it, it, basically you wait five years, that's like a statutory thing, and then it's eligible to be elevated to the principal register. So even if you have a name right now that you think is uh, kind of in the, in the uh, a weak category, uh, after five years, you can still get it uh, up to the uh, principal register if people don't challenge you. It's just that you don't really have any like rights, uh, registered rights in the meantime. Okay, uh, so getting started with trademarks. Um, this is something that you kind of need to start thinking about um, uh, like kind of early. So when you do it, as soon as you're thinking about a name, and I know everybody, before they start a business before they even figured out what they're going to sell and how, the, how they're going to make money. Everybody's thinking about a name. So uh, I, know, I know this is dear, near and dear to your hearts. And so you've you got to start thinking about uh, uh, the, what you're going to do to trademark this name. Um, what you do is a sanity search on Google. Uh, make sure that no, nobody else is doing something too similar to you. And uh, also tests. Uh, it's not the test that we all know and love here at AHS, but it's the uh, trademark electronic search system. Uh, which is a tool available on the patent, uh, the patent office website. Okay, you could go ahead and do a word search on there. Uh, there is a, a rule in terms of trademarks being uh, what we call confusing similarity or likelihood of confusion. That means that in order to infringe your trademark, you don't actually have to literally infringe. You don't have to use those exact words. You could be similar and you could still run into problems. So when you go ahead and do a search, you wanna, uh, let's say that you have caveman foods. I just made that up. Uh, you know, you should search for everything cave, but also maybe K-V-E, maybe crave, you know, like things that sort of sound the same. Uh, is probably going to be relevant to you. Obviously, the more unique, the better. You know, just use your common sense. And then um, you will do the word mark first and then a logo later, okay? So a lot of people, like, invest money in logos and they have a graphics design. They're, oh, this is really cool. It's got a thing, you know, that goes very well. And then they find out that their word mark is infringing. So, oops, basically. You could do all of these things without a lawyer. Um, you... you I mean, if, if you are in doubt, you should probably get a consult from somebody regarding the strength of your mark and everything. But um, I think all this stuff you can do on your own. Um, and I'm, just, I'm not gonna tell you to spend extra money. So uh, how, do you, how do you actually go ahead and do this? How, how long is it gonna take and how much is it gonna cost you? Finally, an application uh, uh, generally is about $750 to $1,000. It includes a PTO fee of $225 uh, per mark per class, and this is a little, um, a, 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 a bit of a finer distinction. So a word mark and a logo mark are two applications. So for example, the McDonald's word mark and the Golden Arch, are that's two separate applications, so you gotta pay that fee twice. And also a word mark used in two classes. When we say classes, we mean that they're uh, essentially different types of products. So a McDonald's hamburger and a McDonald's t-shirt would be two classes, so you have to pay those registrations separately. So kind of think about that as you, you know, your, your, how many products you're selling and you know, how much you want to protect. Um, the uh, length of time is generally no, lo, no less than a year. Uh, it's more if it's refused, if the mark has got some problem and you know, it's refused, and you gotta pay a lawyer a, you know, something like $1,000 to go ahead and argue that. Uh, miscellaneous fees post-registration. Uh, a lot of times people register trademarks that actually haven't used in commerce. They're not selling that product yet. Uh, you, when, when you do uh, get, that, uh, get that trademark granted and you need to prove that you're using the trademark in commerce, you have to file a statement of use and the patent office will charge you $100. Uh, and then there's maintenance fees at five years, um, 10 years, and then every uh, 10 years thereafter. Okay, so where, where can you go wrong? 
okay? So this is where, where I'm telling you guys, you know, you're, you, <laughs> that, that uh, even if you don't hire a lawyer, so kind of be very aware of how this could you know, happen. Um, I feel like the number one issue is that descriptive terms for this particular industry is just like overused. So like you, if you have anything keto or anything paleo, I mean, just pick something else. I mean, <laughs> this, this right now, this is just, uh, it's just too much. Um, not doing a search, not updating your search. Like if you've done a search and then you found that, okay, well, nobody's using this name. Well, do another search in six months. See if somebody has registered it. See if somebody started to also think that this name is clever and uh, uh, do something about it if they're stepping on your territory. Uh, knowledge of a confusingly similar mark and failing to take action, okay? So if you know some, somebody is using a mark and then you just kind of like don't do something for a, a number of years, you're gonna lose the right to challenge them. Uh, you're gonna have to probably end up dealing with that mark in existence with, along with yours or you're gonna probably end up having to change your name or something like that. So it, you know, really not doing something is really not an option. You have to think about that. And then uh, using the R circle without having obtained uh, principal registration. Um, the TM symbol, the small TM symbol is uh, uh, used for just to let people know that you're using that as a trademark. The R is for marks that you've actually registered. You actually received the, the registration certificate. So don't, don't use the R without actually having done that. And then uh, a bunch of other things, you know, picking a bad mark, you know, well, I'll show you an example in a little bit. Uh, wordplay on somebody else's mark, so, you know, let's say Nike has just do it, and then you go just do, as in D-O-O. -O. Um, you're trying to be clever, right? Like, we all try to be clever, but what you're essentially doing is you're appropriating somebody else's uh, uh, intellectual property, and if it's Nike, they're huge, and they make all their money off of licensing, they're gonna sue you. Um, I guarantee you they're gonna, they're gonna sue you. Uh, picking a fight you can't win, um, you know, I, I see this more often than, than you think. You have, some, you have some name, and you know how I said names are similar in this industry, so you have like ABC, and then you go up to another person uh, also using ABC at a trade show, and then go, oh hey, I, you know, you're ABC, I'm also ABC, maybe we could work together. <laughs> you just bought yourself a cease and desist, go ahead, but just, just don't do that. <laughs> Um, example of bad mark, uh, I do a lot of running in downtown LA, and this is on my, one of my regular routes. Um, it's a restaurant, uh, uh, a very trendy, uh, the naming thing is trendy, kind of like Lyft and Uber and, you know, these short little uh, 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 misspelled type of words. So KTCHN, right? Uh, kitchen, downtown, uh, DTLA for downtown LA, so this is a restaurant. And uh, um, yeah. what happens is when you start running past, you know, you see things over and over again, you know, the lawyer's head starts to do free legal work for them. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, I think this is like a descriptive problem, right? It isn't, isn't this sort of descriptive? Like KTCHN just means kitchen, and so kitchen is descriptive of a restaurant, and DTLA is just geographically, you know, uh, descriptive. And so um, I went to go look up their prosecution record. Uh, you can find that, it's all public on the USPTO website. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, you know, it was rejected. Uh, it was descriptive, like, like I said. And then this uh, particular entrepreneur did not hire a lawyer. Uh, it was, um, it was uh, refused one time, the owner went pro bono and basically submitted an argument, says this is named my restaurant, it's my baby, I love this place, I created it, I've worked so hard on it, please give me a trademark. And then of course the patent office said, oh, you know what, that's so persuasive, we totally appreciate the fact that you're, you, have a, you have this restaurant and we're gonna give you a trademark. Of course not, right, it was rejected again and uh, you know, uh, this, this trademark is dead. So, um, she didn't come to this talk. <laughs> uh, dispute resolution uh, in this field, uh, would, uh, there's a lot of cease and desist letters going on. Um, if there is a product that you're selling on Amazon and somebody else is infringing on it, uh, you could file what's, uh, they're essentially like reporting mechanisms on Amazon.com uh, or eBay. Uh, they're often ineffective, but it's just so, kind of like something that you do. Um, what happens is sometimes services will come over and say, we'll file a, a, a complaint for you and charge you like $500. You, this, is, this is something you could do by yourself. You don't, don't pay those guys, you know. Um, you can get somebody's uh, mark canceled before the T-tab. That's essentially an administrative court system within the patent office. Uh, if, if their mark is on, on yours is too similar or you had it before they did, um, you know, you could go ahead and get their, get that uh, sort of cancellation proceeding to get their mark canceled. 
Uh, you can litigate before the International Trade Commission. This is what I said about uh, have getting U.S. Customs to deny their goods entry if they're coming from overseas. Um, you can do a district court action, which is just essentially suing for federal court, uh, uh, suing in federal court. That is very, very expensive, and I just usually try to tell my clients to um, exhaust all these other options before you you go ahead and uh, uh, pursue things in district court. Unfair competition is a uh, related um, related area here. It's uh, Basically, you see this most often in a form of passing off. It's basically when somebody tries to sell you a, a counterfeit product, okay, sell, sell a counterfeit product to, to yours. And uh, the remedies here are all through the courts and litigation. There's uh, no, nothing you can do here on your own. You, if you feel like you're being taken advantage of, you need to find a lawyer. How much, how much time do I have? Oh, I, okay, we're, we're good. So we're gonna move on to copyrights, and th this is good. I've actually uh, showed up here and a bunch of people were asking me like copyright questions, and I was like, oh wow, you guys are, this is a really important field, so I read this slide. Um, what it is, it's basically a right to a creative work, okay? So videos, photos, um, writings, artwork, graphics, uh, computer code, uh, they're all uh, subject to copyright protection. Um, there is a finite duration it's very complicated as to how long that is, but we kind of jokingly like to call infinity minus one year. Um, it's basically you create something and then it, it would supposed to fall into the public domain after a certain number of years, but you know companies like Disney who don't want Mickey Mouse falling into the public domain keeps lobbying Congress to extend it. So pretty much if you create anything these days, it's going to last well beyond your lifetime. Um, it, the duration is probably not something that you really need to worry about. Um, the, what copyrights are not, okay? So they're not a person's mere image or likeness. Um, you always have a right to take a picture or a video in public. If you're kind of like a, a, a podcaster or a videographer or something, you, you, you know, people say that, oh yeah, my likeness is copyrighted or something, no, 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 just pull them off. Um, that's, that's not uh, relevant or that's just wrong. Uh, databases of public information, uh, like phone books, phone numbers, uh, those are not copyrightable. Getting started in this field, uh, not a whole lot to do. Uh, you just need to document your creation. You need to know like the dates uh, that you created something and uh, so that you can prove infringement. It used to be that people uh, used to register their copyrighted works with the copyright office. Uh, but these days, you, know, you, know, you don't need to do that. If you could just prove that you, you made it and you made it this date, there's no reason to send it up to the copyright office. And, and uh, I know that sometimes uh, Services will do that and charge you a couple hundred dollars. You know, as I've said, that's kind of gimmicky. Don't pay them. Okay, so where can you go wrong, right? This this is uh, 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 a lot. As you, anybody who does websites and uses uh, random pictures on the internet knows, <laughs> um, the common uh, infringement scenarios are uh, just basically accidentally incorporating somebody else's IP uh, into into uh, a, a, you know something that you're making. Um, this happens a lot in podcasting, where you're interviewing somebody, and then -na 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 -na, you know uh, the, the the ringtone goes off, and then the person says, "Oh, I'm sorry, you know, turn off the phone." You think nothing of it, right? But that ringtone is copyrighted, and now it's in your whatever medium, you know, that you're propagating and you're distributing. And then you know, if you're a movie maker or something, you, like two weeks before your premiere, you get a cease and desist. I mean, you're, you're like screwed, right? <laughs> you, don't, you definitely don't want that to happen. You have to be careful like where these things are coming from. Sometimes people film in public and then they have like, the, the, you know, they get TV in the background or like, or like radio from a mall or something like that. You know, that's all copyrighted stuff. Uh, device things, warning tones, things in your car, you open the door, go ding, ding, ding. You know, be careful. Um, this is something that came up last night. I had a client, you know, I was kind of leaving the, um, uh, uh, the party, um, you know, a little sloshed, and then my client says, uh, hey, you know, I've, I've got this uh, <laughs> playing music thing, you know, like in a gym, can I do that? And, and this is actually a bit of a problem. If you're, if you're playing music in members-only areas of a gym where people have to pay an admission to attend a class, so if you're playing music in, in like, say, a salsa class or a part of a bar where people are dancing or you're doing, like, you know, hot yoga and you're playing music or something, that's going to require a special license. Uh, just kind of plugging it into your Pandora uh, is not going to fly. Doing, using Pandora Business is not going to fly. You have to read special licensing agreements with, like, the, the big uh, music licensors like BMI and uh, people like that. 
Um, I think they only really go after egregious offenders, like if you're having this big bar and then you're just playing music on the dance floor and you pay nothing, but um, this is just yet another area where you could get into trouble. Um, okay, so relying on copyrights and not patents. If, if people, uh, if you have things like source code, uh, reverse engineering is actually fair use. Okay, so you wrote a code, you compiled it, somebody uh, uh, said, oh, oh yeah, you know what, I'm just gonna code this back and, and, and uh, uh, do my own thing, and then you try to go after them uh, on copyrights, that theory is going to fail, because you know, they essentially, what they did was they reverse engineered the functionality and wrote their own code, and uh, you don't have any rights to it. So uh, some, you, you probably should consider patents if you have a lot of code that, that you're, you're an app developer and you're trying to protect that. Um, there's some fair use defenses here. If you're using things and you're not trying to make money, so non-commercial use, uh, free speech concerns like uh, parody, satire, criticism, uh, uh, analysis, uh, being a content distributor versus uh, um, like like if you're just aggregating stuff and then putting it on your website and then people could kind of click through it, uh, making a, a YouTube list of uh, videos, uh, uh, that's going to be fine. Or de minimis, you know, if the infringement is very, very little. Um, it, then uh, sometimes it's uh, there's not 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 much damages to collect, but the problem is that you might you might still get sued anyway. And that suit is going to cost you way more to defend than that actual infringement that the damages you'll have to pay, and that's just going to be a pain in the butt. So one take home point here is don't ever base a business model on fair use. Okay, that means that uh, if you're trying to make money on other people's IP that's probably gonna get you in trouble. So like, you know how I would say I was, if you're aggregating YouTube videos, but then if you sell ads on your website and you create like no other value than just like clicks, somebody's probably gonna find you and, and you know, um, get you in trouble. So the fair use defenses basically uh, go up to the limit of when you start to make money. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go through patents really quickly because this is just super complicated. Uh, a patent is a government-granted monopoly, okay, on an invention, so like a technology, for a fixed term. That term is 20 years from the date of filing. Um, the protection is limited to essentially technology, and here's how it works. Uh, you get a fixed term, you get a monopoly on whatever it is you're trying to do, uh, this technology, this thing that you've invented. However, you have to disclose it to the public in return for this monopoly. Um, and you have to disclose it enough, in enough detail such that a person can use it and, and, and basically create it on their own. So it's just basically it's just this exchange. In exchange for your monopoly for 20 years from filing, you have to disclose it for all of posterity to see, to create this technology. Um, the most uh, valuable type of patents is, you, you, uh, is a utility patent, and they have the uh, terms useful, novel, and non-obvious. Those are legal terms, uh, like the, the um, general requirements that you have to prove. For uh, design patents, which protects ornamental designs, um, uh, features that are not functional, they don't have any utility, but they're nonetheless, you know, they're, they're there to, for decorative ornamental designs that's uh, protected by a design patent. And also for plants and microbes, uh, that's, uh, 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 you know, like genetic modification. These days you could go ahead and um, uh, patent some of those uh, uh, microbial um, uh, organisms if you'd like, okay? So uh, again, utility patents are most valuable, most expensive to obtain. There's uh, several types, mechanical for mechanical devices, uh, things you could play with, electrical and software for code, uh, apps, you know, um, things with circuits in them. Uh, biochem for uh, biochemical type of processes. Uh, business methods is probably relevant to nobody here. Um, it's for very large organizations with very specific workflows that they kind of want to patent how to do something uh, in a very specific way and, 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 and try to get some protection there. And also user interfaces. Again, if you're in the app space, um, you would have a, uh, you, could, you could protect your, your user interface and how you organize the buttons and things like that. Okay, um, so trade secrets. So this is uh, something that's related to patents. Sometimes your patentable subject matter is too easily stolen or too easily reproduced with very little consequence, right? So uh, an example of this would be the Coke recipe. 
um, it's it's super easy to steal the Coke recipe and 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 to and to make uh, your own Coke, so they keep it like in a vault and uh, net, let nobody see it. That's essentially trade secrets. Um, how you how do you protect a trade secret? You must actually keep it a secret. Okay, you can't email people and go, oh yeah, okay, so this is a thing, and then when you find out that somebody else is using it and go, oh no, that's my trade secret. You actually have to have a process um, that protects this particular trade secret. It's like non-disclosure agreements, you know, with people who handle it or receive it, you know, your 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 partners, and then you have record keeping, and you have to make sure they destroy your trade secret when they're done with it. So just that paperwork process again, you know, keeping records is going to help you. Um, I'm gonna kind of get through this very quickly. This is the patent prosecution process. You know, there's a bunch of different things you can file. Uh, generally, the take-home point here is. Uh, no user serviceable parts inside. Uh, don't open, you're gonna get killed. High voltage, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, so I, I really have like way too many stories of clients who decided that, oh yeah, like I think I'm gonna get a patent so uh, you know, I don't need you anymore and then they totally like blow themselves up because I can go look at the file, you know how it's all public. I go look at it like a year or, late, or later and then they just like miss some deadline or something, it's really embarrassing. Um, so again, a dispute resolution, you could, you know, similarly, you could just shut, shut them down in, at the import level. You can go to the district courts to sue. It's really, really expensive. You know, we're talking uh, $500,000 uh, legal fees to start a patent lawsuit. So it's, it's uh, pretty much crazy. You, you can um, uh, defensively also uh, uh, kind of do an administrative court process to try to get somebody's patents uh, invalidated. That um, it, you can challenge patents that way. So uh, let me see here. I'm, I'm just gonna skip through this. <laughs> so here's the bottom line, um, and this this is a, a, a favorite slide of mine that it comes from a website called Despair.com, uh, uh, where they make uh, like you know how people have de uh, motivational posters. They make demotivational posters, <laughs> and this is my favorite slide because it just this just encapsulates. Patent prosecution perfectly for me, and this, this is how you you know you go wrong. And this is what it says: it's mediocrity. It takes a lot less time, and most people won't notice the difference until it's too late. <laughs> and you got the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and and it, this is what happens: is that you you take a patent disclosure, and then you're you're kind of half-assing it, you, or, or you do it by yourself. You know that's how you go wrong, and then you're trying to build these foundational. Uh, uh, you know when you're trying to you're build on trying to build on top of it, and trying to build you what eventually you hope would be allowable patent and then you, you realize the whole thing's like like that and it's just not gonna stand up. Um, so the risk of failure is high and it's underappreciated. Uh, this game is often f for the benefit of larger players with really, really good ex attorneys and just people with money. Um, however, it may be essential for uh, if you're trying to get your business bought out, if you're trying to get funding People will ask you, have you protected your patent? If you have like technology, it's, just, it's something that you should think about. You, you should have some patents pending. You, you know, even if you don't have something, you, know, you can probably uh, uh, you know, really elevate the value of your business if you're in that field. So okay, uh, finding and working with attorneys. Um, such pains in the butts. Uh, let's see, so for trademarks and copyrights, I think a general business lawyer or somebody who just called themselves a, an IP attorney uh, would be adequate to do the jobs. For patents, you, you do need a, a, a patent attorney or a patent agent for all respects. Uh, patent attorneys are attorneys that have passed the state bar in addition to passing a licensing exam before the patent office, okay? So only those people can tell, call themselves patent attorneys. Patent agents are not attorneys, so they can't dispense legal advice. They can file cases for you, but they can't really help you, so they're really of limited applicability. Um, one thing that may help you is that patent attorneys and agents, because it's all federal law, they can work across state lines, and uh, you know, if your home state is a little short on this type of talent, you can kind of expand, I mean, yeah, we all work online these days anyhow. Um, if you are sued, or if your case appears headed to court, then you need what's called a litigator, uh, or any of the ab above attorneys who, who can also uh, take the case uh, for you in court. Uh, attorney referrals, um, I'm just gonna say, that this is like a pet peeve of mine, uh, and a conversation goes like this. So, oh, hey Ben, I'm, uh, my, er my marriage is failing, 
and I need a divorce attorney. So are you like friends with any divorce attorneys? Can you like refer me to some people? And the first thing that goes through my head is how dare you associate me with divorce attorneys? And you can't believe you think that I'm friends with divorce attorneys and you know, <laughs> you just insulted me. Um, but the idea is that I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so this is free legal work. I, I do nothing, I do nothing close to divorces. I can't ever do any of this work. So I'm basically doing free legal work to go find an attorney for you. So I'm gonna Google for 20 minutes and come up with a couple of names and say, okay, you know, you go do your own thing. Uh, the bottom line is this, if I can't vouch for a fellow attorney's work product, if I don't know clients that he, he uh, serves, um, your guess is as good as mine, basically. So the next question is uh, often, well, can't you get a referral fee from some of these attorneys? Can't you make some money off of my business? And the answer actually is, is no. Uh, it, th this field is fraught with ethical issues. The bar really doesn't like you know, refer referral fee arrangements. Um, they're, uh, it's just ethically dubious, because first of all, it requires client consent. I have to disclose to you if I'm taking a referral fee. Other, the, the, the attorneys that's taking the case has to disclose to you that he's giving a referral fee, and then so basically I got a half a piece of paper on your signature, and you're coming to me asking me about divorce. I'm not going to make you sign something. So basically, I'm never going to get paid. Basically, um, yeah. So this is a little uh, hairy, and uh, uh, sometimes you know attorneys ask for a lot of ridiculous fees. You know, there there uh, there's a was this one guy who called me up and said I have this client you know that I can refer to you, but I want 20% of all the billings, and I'm like. Wow, I hope nobody hauls you before the state bar for that, you know, because 20% for making a phone call is like probably uh, per se unethical. Um, so beware of overly enthusiastic referrals. If somebody says, you know what, oh yeah, divorces, I have just the guy for you, you know, he does all these divorces, he does all my friends' divorces, everybody loves getting a divorce from him. Yeah, you know, this, this, type, this type of talk. And, and then you, you're kind of like thinking, warning light, you know, going off in your head thinking that uh, maybe there's a fee involved and, you know, he's just not telling you. So make your own decision based on what you find out. Uh, how to find a good attorney? Um, this is a little tough, but one thing that you can do on your own is like a sanity check. Is, uh, is this person good on paper, right? Take a look at his disciplinary record on the state bar. Uh, you could all find that online. You could just type in his name on the, on the state, in the state that he's, uh, uh, he's barred under. And uh, uh, look to see if there's any like, particular issues, like if the clients have like pressed uh, uh, charges, you know, in uh, state court or what have you. If it's a, if it's a patent attorney, um, you can also check the OED. It's the Office of Enrollment uh, and Discipline uh, at the uh, PTO, and uh, they they kind of maintain the the patent bar registration. So you you should just check both. Uh, Google is your friend. You know, like see if this person has been involved in fraud or you know whatever cases. Uh, kind of almost everybody has a bit of a paper trail. So just kind of Google a little. Uh, does the attorney represent people in your industry? Okay, so um, I'll say this as a patent attorney. I mean, I do a lot of computer uh, software stuff and uh, I do a lot of like general mechanical stuff, but in terms of biochem, um, that's like got molecules and stuff. I don't really do that. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's really important to ask like the attorney, what kind of cases do you do? You know, a lot of times they'll, they'll say yes to your case and then try to figure it out. Um, so it's important to ask that question. Uh, experience with the patent office, um, this is a little hard to find. Uh, the patent office hires a lot of introverts and they don't really come out and start their own businesses and uh, uh, you know come out and give talks and things like that. So this is a bit of a unicorn feature, but uh, we're, if you can find somebody like this, uh, they will help in cases where uh, they've been stuck at the patent office forever, they've been pending forever and we don't know what's going on. Uh, maybe the previous attorney had an argument with the examiner and pissed the examiner off, and so now that case is just like um, uh, the examiner's pissed off, basically. So sometimes you can get somebody to uh, to restart that process, and somebody who understands the patent office black box will be able to help you a little better. Um, and ultimately, I think in uh, most of my experience is that clients are really not looking for the smartest guy in the room or, uh, you know, somebody who's the most aggressive or somebody who's the, who could just is willing to play the most hardball. I think it's ultimately they want somebody that you can trust and that who will call them back, who will answer their emails, who's kind of like a reassuring presence instead of a hot mess. Um, so, and, and so in this sense, you know, your gut feeling about somebody is really important, right? And I mean, I know we're at a paleo conference, your gut feeling is always important, but <laughs> here, you know, if you don't like somebody, don't hire them. 
Okay, so um, pitfalls with some attorneys, not doing your own homework, you know, kind of like going in there, you know, if you're walking in there, you, know, you, you, you can't tell a trademark and a copyright um, uh, uh, from a patent, you know, I'll be really happy to teach you at my hourly rate. Um, waiting until the last minute, kind of like time issues, uh, not setting deadlines, uh, not following up, um, and then the attorney's like, well, if you're not in a hurry, I'm not in a hurry, everybody's busy. Uh, not reserving company resources or employee time for the attorney, okay? So a lot of times, you know, especially if I'm doing patents, I need to take very detailed invention disclosures. And if you, if you don't impress upon your people, it is that it is your job to come talk to me and you have to, to spend a lot of time talking to me to make sure I get what I want and I get blown off. Um, I mean, I'm gonna try really hard to, to try to take this disclosure, but it, after a while, I'm just gonna give up, right? Because this is like your thing. And if I can't get your people to talk to me, then, you know, we're just not gonna get anywhere. So, th so, so you, you really have to dedicate some time and, and some processes are very, very, very involved. Uh, demanding assurances about results, this is really annoying. Um, is my invention patentable? And I'm like, well, I don't know. <laughs> That's what the prosecution process is for, right? Like until the examiner actually gives you a piece of paper that says, uh, 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 you know, it's allowed. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I can give you, I can give you my opinion based on the uh, my best judgment, but this kind of answer, no, ma no matter how I answer, almost always gets me into trouble, so I don't like to give that answer. And then just a little bit about reasonableness of fees. If the attorney says that this, his hourly rate is like this much, and then you know he says, oh, but I can do this work for you, and then you kind of just do the math and go, oh, well, maybe he could only spend 50 minutes on a letter or what have you. I mean, is that like really reasonable? Um, kind of think about that. Uh, in the context of how much you know you're paying for the work, and uh, if the rate is too low, you know then maybe there's going to be some quality issues. Um, one final point: um, patent and trademark prosecution, the process of actually getting a patent or getting a trademark these days, uh, you should almost always be able to negotiate a flat rate or a, a, a fee cap. Um, the hourly rate for that kind of work is pretty rare these days, and uh, I would say for smaller players, you definitely want to go ahead and tell them I want a flat fee, because uh, if you do hourly rate, it's going to be um, yeah, very unpredictable. However, it's still very customary in litigation, uh, in lawsuits and, and uh, filings and things like that, which is uh, uh, why it's so expensive. So I want to end with this, and I am going to end right on time. Uh, who is your best advocate, right? Is it like your, you know, somebody like me, your lawyer, your uh, employees, uh, families and friends, you know, customers, social media, you know, who's, the, who's just uh, raving about your product all day? Um, this person is actually yourself, right? You, you've created this thing and um, you want to bring it to the world and it's really valuable to you, and, and this is something that you created, and obviously you're in it for yourself because you want to make money, but you're also, you, you have this really cool thing that you want to share with other people, and uh, you know, the, the people that you are involved in and bring this dream to fruition is obviously people uh, like me who's going to help, but ultimately you are still responsible for that, and the more uh, thought you put into this process, um, the um, better your results will be. Okay, so uh, Q and A. Uh, this is my information, and uh, uh, we're all m among friends here. So if you mention AHS uh, uh, when you reach out to me, uh, you'll get a free consult. So um, okay, and uh, if we, if anybody wants to stay after to talk about patents, uh, uh, we could spend some time doing that as well. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>